In my video on Tim Squirrel, I forgot to include two bits of information, so let's go over them right now. Firstly, when I mentioned that Tim was complaining about the public's effort to get him deplatformed right after his involvement in getting PayPal and Stripe to pull out a subscribe star, I didn't include the screenshots of him doing so. So let's take a peek at those. Look at this disingenuous clown. Secondly, as it turns out, when Tim Squirrel was the president of the Cambridge Union Society, one of his regular guests to their shindigs sexually harassed several members of the committee. Tim only chose to comment on it three years later, because the truth leaked out through another source. I'm complicit in the culture of harassment by figures of status. During my time as president of Cambridge Union, I failed to act. A guest, well known on Twitter and a frequent invitee, sexually harassed a committee member. I informally asked he never be reinvited. I never made sure that he was officially blacklisted, and I don't know that the current committees are aware. I finally emailed them. I should have done it earlier, and I can only apologize for not making sure he was shunned from Cambridge Union before. I'm not asking for forgiveness or flagellation. I just want other men to rethink. Have you done everything you can to stop harassment? Do you call out abuse when you see it? Do you make sure that abusers are unable to gain access and status again? If not, please do. I can't name the person concerned for fear of li libel accusations. They are a lawyer and appear in papers regularly. I wish I could. I screwed up. I'm sorry. I can only try to not be complicit again. I'm sure I'll fail, but I'll fail better. I'm so sorry. How many lefties have taken a gigantic steaming shit on Milo Yiannopoulos for not outing the pedophiles he knows exist in Hollywood, despite Milo being at risk of slander? Are those same lefties now going to destroy one of their own for the same mistake using the same excuse? I doubt it. You know, I lived in Hollywood a, a while ago, uh, Did you? Brief, briefly. And Did you go to um, one of his parties? I, I went to other people who I won't name um, mm -hmm. of a similar stature in Hollywood. I went to their boat parties and to their house parties and things, and some of the things I have seen have beggared belief. Yeah? yeah. Can you give us like a... Well, just... I can't... I don't want to be indiscreet about specific people. Right, you don't have to I do think that. It's going just to dance be, around the facts. Yeah, dangerous. Yeah. But I can tell you the truth without dropping anyone in it. Okay. I mean, some of the boys there were very young. Very young. And, and I, this I is really recently? I don't remember... No, no, like, I don't know, eight years ago. Um, I don't Statue remember... Statue limitations. <laughs> I don't remember um, whether I ever met Brian Singer or whether mm -hmm. I, I, know, I even knew who he was then. But I knew other people of similar stature, as I say, and there were some very young boys around at that time. There was a lot of drugs and a lot of... Um, Twinks. A lot of twinks taking drugs and having unsafe sex with older men, and some of these boys were very young. It's always fascinating to me to see shitty people within the progressive left get caught with their pants down, and wondering if they're either going to be a victim of a purity spiral, or forgiven and forgotten because they're just so important to the cause that social justice needs to pardon them in order to continue making headway. As it turns out, Tim Squirrel is one of the latter possibly due to his connection to Sleeping Giants. You know, they may be worth a video someday. But enough about the rancid rodent. The implosion of Patreon has steadily continued since my last video, and I want to cover the important points. As more and more people, creators and patrons alike, began to abandon Patreon, in the wake of Patreon going completely against both its terms of service and the spoken word of its CEO in the company's arbitrary banning of Sargon of Akkad, it seems like they might have begun to panic a little bit. Patreon's trust and safety team, headed up by Jacqueline Hart, a woman we went over extensively in my Socialist Republic of Patreon video, sent an unsolicited message to the YouTuber Matt Christensen. A quick recap, Jacqueline Hart appears to be a corporate feminist, has the business and financial chops, but spends a lot of time at women's conferences and on diversity teams and shit. The message reads as follows. I understand that some of your patrons have left due to the decision of Patreon to remove Sargon's page from our site. I want to reach out to you directly to address the topic and ensure you have all the information you may need. Our experience with each creator is individual and we are open to speaking with you should you have questions regarding your account specifically. We want to provide you with the tools to make your Patreon experience a successful one and keep you feeling supported whenever you may need. Keep in mind that, again, this message was unsolicited. This is Patreon trying to reassure its creators that Sargon's banning due to subjective enforcement of the rules was a one-time thing. And that everybody else's livelihoods are totally safe, guys. You can trust us. Well, this message ultimately led to a phone call between Matt Christensen and Jacqueline Hart on the 20th of December. I'm not going to read over the full thing. If you want that, you can listen to Sargon's video recreating the call. V makes for a pretty good woman. But I will discuss what I feel are the two most integral points. Matt and Jacqueline go back and forth on free speech and why people are abandoning Patreon for the first bit of the call, which leads to this exchange. Jacqueline, the problem is that Patreon takes payments. And while we are obviously supportive of the First Amendment, 
there are other things that we have to consider. Our mission is to fund the creative class. In order to accomplish that mission, we have to build a community of creators that are comfortable sharing a platform. And if we allow certain types of speech that some people would call free speech, then only creators that use Patreon that don't mind their branding associated with that kind of speech would be those who use Patreon and we would fail at our mission. But secondly, as a membership platform, payment processing is one of the core value propositions that we have. Payment processing depends on our ability to use the global payment network, and they have rules for what they will process. Matt, are you telling me that this was Patreon's decision then, or someone pressured you into this? Jacqueline, no, this was entirely Patreon's decision. Matt, well then I don't understand passing the buck off to somebody else. Jacqueline, no, I'm not passing the buck off. The thing is, we have guidelines, but I'm trying to explain. Number one, it is our mission to fund the creative class. And obviously some people may not want to be associated. Matt, well, if it's your mission, then payment processors are irrelevant. It's your mission. That's what you're pursuing. Jacqueline, we're not Visa and MasterCard ourselves. We can't just make the rules. That's what I'm saying. There's an extra layer here. There's also a contradiction here. Jacqueline's saying that it was absolutely Patreon's decision to boot Sargon off, but also says that we're not Visa and MasterCard, we can't just make the rules ourselves. So we have three possibilities. One, this is something that Patreon itself did independent of any other force, which would mean that a consumer boycott of them is justified. Two, Patreon is being forced by Visa or MasterCard somehow to do this. And it does seem a bit explicable that credit card companies would be taking a direct interest in Sargon. Or three, Patreon and these companies line up ideologically, and it was both something handed down on high, as well as something Patreon agreed with internally, which presents a much bigger problem. Let's talk about the second point in the transcript, the inherent subjectivity that Patreon is embracing as a part of their guidelines. Jacqueline, so the thing about Sargon is that we do an entire review where we look at your body of work and determine that this is what you, and have you done this multiple times. We have to look at this as your body of work and you as a creator. Matt, so you're saying it's individual treatment. Jacqueline, yes. Matt, how is that possibly a viable standard? Shouldn't it be a uniform treatment for everybody? Jacqueline, that is a really great question. And yes, we would love it to be a uniform standard for everyone. But as you might imagine, it's quite difficult to make something so granular. And I actually don't know if we want to go in that direction because it takes the human element out of it. Right now today, we have humans that review and reach out to our creators. And so of course there are problems with the human process. But we don't want this to be about bots taking you down because you said three words that were over the threshold. We want this to be a holistic review. Matt, do you understand how that's inherently subjective? Jacqueline, yes, I do. Matt, okay, and do you understand how that would make creators like myself and everybody who's leaving very nervous and untrusting of your platform? Jacqueline, so the thing that we try to do here is have the most diverse team we possibly can have so that we have transparency and so that we have multiple views on this. Not that we're operating in some kind of echo chamber. We like to have a process that we have a lot of differing opinions on when we review creators. Maybe I'll take some flack for this, but I actually partially agree with Jacqueline's response here. This is why we have the concept of the spirit and letter of the law. Exceptions prove the rule, but exceptions do exist nonetheless. And oftentimes it may be necessary for rules and guidelines to contain some wiggle room so that you can actually deal with an extraordinary circumstance that wasn't foreseen when the guidelines were written. From that perspective, it not only makes sense, but is preferable that the guidelines be subject to human judgment. For example, the biggest problem with YouTube is that it entirely lacks this subjective judgment. Copyright strikes are filed on videos by content ID bots and escalated by other bots that have no idea about context or fair use. Believe it or not, this is something that I have a fair bit of experience with. But trying to find people who will be both subjective and also fair in their judgments is the wrench in the machinery. And that is where Patreon has gone wrong. They're judging everybody on a case-by-case -case basis. If they were doing that ideologically neutral, if they were doing it with a full understanding of context or humor or parody, then maybe it would be okay. But that's not what they're doing. And a subjective system that makes no attempt to be fair is far more tyrannical than a purely automated objective system like YouTube's. And Jacqueline's further comments on the subject describe how Patreon's subjective system does not even attempt to be fair in the slightest, but does indeed follow an ideology. Jacqueline, again, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Every creator is allowed the chance to appeal. I want to make sure that's perfectly clear. Whenever we take action on someone's account, they can always appeal. And so that offer was given to Milo, of course. But the thing with his disavowal is that it has to be creators who make that choice, and it's not just... Like if you look at the disavowal, it was a situation where I think a lot of people said this wasn't really a disavowal. Matt, okay, so it's a subjective judgment about whether the disavowal is good enough? Jacqueline, basically you can discuss groups on Patreon, but any creator who is praising or actively supporting these groups won't be allowed on Patreon. Matt, I praise Milo and I enjoy Milo, 
I've got his picture right back there, actually. Does that make me an associate of a banned person? Am I bannable for that association? I'll tell you right now, I like the guy. I think he's great. Jacqueline. No, of course. And the thing is, like, my personal feelings have nothing to do with it. But the thing is, it's not Milo that you're being associated with. That's more about a group that you're praising. Matt. Well, I'm praising him, and he's not allowed on Patreon. Why would that not be a similar association? Jacqueline. Praising Milo is not equal to hate speech or something of that nature. Matt. What did he do that's equal to hate speech or something of that nature? Jacqueline. I don't want to get into specific cases. Matt. You emailed me with reference to a specific case. That's the nature of this conversation. The origin of it. In the New York Times article, Patreon bars anti-feminists for racist speech, inciting revolt, it stated that if someone has breached Patreon's policy, the company contacts the offender with a specific plan, which usually involves asking for the content to be removed and for a public apology. Ms. Hart says, We handhold creators and we work with them one-on-one, -on -one, and nearly every creator reforms, so it's quite a successful process. Sargon did not respond to attempts to engage him in the reform process. Patreon does not view its creators or its users as clients. It views them as children that need to be nannied, or in their own words, handheld. And when one steps out of line, they need to be re-educated, or in their own words, reformed. No self-respecting human being would engage in their reform process on principle because patreon is a company of tyrants where the most important thing is that you bend the knee admit you were wrong and beg them for forgiveness this is not a business relationship it is serfdom for a while especially earlier in the patreon purge saga it seemed like jacqueline hart was at the center of everything despite what we've just read i no longer believe that to be the case but nonetheless let's continue going over her involvement because she's still a notable player in the whole event and it will lead us to our next destination. We've already seen Jacqueline's career laid out on LinkedIn, a page she has since deleted. I wonder if there's anything else in it she's trying to hide. Here's a timeline for you. On August 30th, 2018, Patreon hosts a Women's Trust Network event. Jacqueline Hart attends, and soon afterward is hired at Patreon. At this point, her LinkedIn contained glowing reviews from her former colleagues at PayPal. And PayPal's interest in Patreon is more than just ideological. PayPal's former president, David Marcus, invested in Patreon in order to get it off the ground. Another significant investor in Patreon is Thrive Capital, which is also a significant investor in Stripe. And, just as a funny aside, Joshua Kushner, brother of Jared Kushner, the son-in-law of Donald Trump, is also the founder of Thrive Capital. I guess your one degree of separation from Trump didn't stop the God Emperor from putting a hit on you, eh, Sargon? As it turns out, though, Sleeping Giants also blackmailed Stripe two months ago, during the deplatforming of Gab. It's no wonder that Stripe acted so quickly on Subscribestar after Tim Squirrel alerted the Sleeping Giants. It's no wonder that when Stripe deplatformed BitChute, they mentioned unknown business partners as the reason. Going back a bit, though, it's important to note what these Women's Trust Network events are centered around. We need more women in trust and safety. Collecting data is important. Elevating women's voices, and so on. It's a deadly mix of progressivist intersectionality and neoliberalist globalism. Milo's Patreon is complained about en masse by SJWs and social media, and Patreon responds by publicly banning him, with a significant media circus around the event. In my opinion, it's likely that Jacqueline walked into another Patreon-hosted women's event shortly thereafter, with the Milo embarrassment hanging over her head. So she may have decided to offer up Sargon's account as a way of clearing her name. And it's also possible that our old friends at Sleeping Giants were involved again as well, because shortly after the Milo news broke, Akila, obviously, a small-time YouTuber currently embroiled in a lawsuit with Sargon, requested on Twitter that Sleeping Giants pull their hidden strings to get Sargon's funding cut. I guess the lawsuit's not going so hot. It's possible that Akila's tweet means nothing, but Tim Squirrel and Deplatform Hate have shown us that small-time accounts with big backroom connections do get things done. And keep in mind Jacqueline's own admission that Patreon does not proactively review their own site, but relies on user reports to their system. Akila's tweet to the Sleeping Giants may have been all that was needed to shine the spotlight. And at that point, all that would be required is Patreon having a Sargon complaint tucked away in their backlog, sent by, you know, whoever, for them to fabricate a reason. All that was needed was an excuse to use it. There's no definitive proof of this theory, but to me personally anyway, this is how it looks. It's been said that the Patreon purge feels like Gamergate happening all over again. The mythical Gamergate 2, where the monumental fuck-up of one corrupt woman blew the lid off an entire corrupt industry, exposing people making backroom deals, controlling narratives, and cutting people out for the wrong politics. I think that's an accurate description, because as tempting as it is to lay all this at the feet of our new Zoe Quinn and call it a day, 
Well, as it turns out, there's a lot more to this than meets the eye, and only a small part of it can really be blamed on Patreon. Jacqueline said that despite the decision being Patreons to ban Sargon, we're not Visa and MasterCard ourselves, we can't just make the rules. MasterCard's been known to pull strings like this before. David Horowitz claims that his Freedom Foundation was cut off by Visa and MasterCard after falsely being labeled a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center, though Visa would later pipe up to say that they weren't involved. Subscribestar was cut off by virtually every payment processor out there, from PayPal to Payoneer to Stripe, including both Visa and MasterCard. Mega Upload was cut off by MasterCard back in 2010, with somebody at the site asking, are payment processors trying to become the legislation of the new decade? Will it be them rather than elected governments who decide what's right and wrong? In 2011, WikiLeaks was cut off by Visa and MasterCard in much the same way as Mega Upload. Though, while Visa said WikiLeaks was only under investigation, MasterCard blasted them for breaking the law, which is the very point of uncovering government corruption, by the way. Jihad Watch was banned from Patreon due to a request from MasterCard, not PayPal, not Visa, not Patreon themselves, but from MasterCard, solely because of the possibility of illegal content from their work. Not confirmed illegal content, but may have illegal content. It seems like MasterCard specifically has been meddling in these affairs. The women's business and network meetings that Jacqueline Hart regularly attended consistently put forward two motivations, the importance of inclusivity and the importance of data collection. We can also see MasterCard follow suit in valuing these two motivations above all others. In 2016, MasterCard began to file patents relating to mechanisms that can predict political events. Given the relationship between politics and finance, this on its own is not a problem, but it does lay the groundwork for what will follow. In 2018, Google would begin to buy MasterCard data to link online ads shown to users with their offline purchases using MasterCard. This is, again, not a surprise, as big tech has been grubby with everybody's data for years now. But what does MasterCard stand to gain from it? Here's a salient section from MasterCard's political activity statement. Any political activities in which MasterCard engages are based solely upon the best interests of the company and are made without regard to the private political preferences of its officers and or executives. The statement is also repeated on their code of conduct, under the header, we engage in the political process responsibly and ethically. If MasterCard did apply pressure to PayPal, Payoneer, Stripe, or Patreon over David Horowitz, Subscribestar, or Jihad Watch, these statements make it seem like they're doing it not for an ideological purpose, but because they believe it to be in their best business interests. However, if you needed more proof that there's a special relationship between PayPal and MasterCard, much like the special relationship between Patreon and PayPal from my previous video, you can always look at the specialized PayPal credit card from MasterCard. Or look at this article from 2016, PayPal and MasterCard expand partnership to benefit consumers, merchants, and financial institutions. Or look at a laundry list of employees who have transferred jobs back and forth between PayPal and MasterCard, like Robert Stever, Nitin Shravastava, Liam Spence, Monica Jazuga, John Mwangi, Jesse Tran, Karen Pasco, Atula Beg, Razia Sultana, Beth Kitchener, Roger Griffith, Luke Ulbrich, Diego Schenhendler, Adrian Collard, or Eduardo Raihi. This goes without saying, obviously, but please don't go after these people personally. This is just to show how PayPal and MasterCard have each other's hands in their pockets. But speaking of dropping names, here's an interesting one. George Soros and MasterCard partner up to provide aid to migrants and refugees. Yeah, anytime you mention George Soros, people immediately begin screaming anti-Semite or conspiracy theorist. So I'm going to do my absolute best to avoid that, alright? Despite Soros being the prince of fucking darkness. I kid, obviously but there's multiple vectors that show him to be involved. Another social media activist group, Hope Not Hate, is funded by Soros through the Open Society, and they fully admit to being part of the lobbying pressure to get Lauren Southern off Patreon. Her removal was always in defense of mass migration. But we already know George Soros is involved with the economic migrant situation. So what's different now? Well, the agendas of both George Soros and MasterCard line up, and they both have the means and the motivation to assist each other. They both attend the yearly Davos Summit, and shortly after the 2015 one, on both sides, a lot of financial inclusion stuff began to spring up, which is a concept we'll cover a little bit later. They're both on the Council of Foreign Relations, along with PayPal and some other very interesting names not directly pertinent to this video. Visa and American Express, to contrast, do not seem to be on the council. The CRF claims to be apolitical in its mission statement, but a lot of its component businessmen seem to be neoliberal globalists. With the current president of the council, Richard Haas, penning an article titled 
Liberal World Order, RIP, where he laments the damage that populist movements within democratic countries have done to the global project. It would seem that leftist politics is considered to be in the best interests of MasterCard, not in its CEOs or others within the company, but of MasterCard as a corporation. Funding pride parades is one obvious marker of that, but certainly not the biggest or most important. A lot of SJWs and Twitter lefties like to have a go at MasterCard online over their funding of hate groups. But unlike tweeting at Patreon, this probably has little effect. Nonetheless, MasterCard still takes an active role in politics. There's an overwhelming number of MasterCard hosted or attended events, panels, presentations, and foundations, all revolving around what boils down to some type of intersectional social justice progressive bullshit. But there's a repeating theme weaving through all of them, which I would like to call digital identity. Digital identity is a fusion of the two motivations from earlier, inclusivity and data. Allow me to show you a few instances of MasterCard valuing those two qualities above all else, before we come back to their merger in the concept of digital identity. MasterCard's Center for Inclusive Growth funded a study titled, Should Nonprofit Leaders Rethink the Relationship Between Political and Charitable Giving? One of the people who's worked at both MasterCard and PayPal, Beth Kitchener, has penned a number of articles related to both inclusivity and data. MasterCard's boss just told a Saudi audience that data is the new oil. MasterCard CEO AJ Banga stated that he considered data a public good and not just a commercial tool. Multiple high ups at MasterCard, including chief inclusion officers, vice presidents of diversity and inclusion, and other equally meaningless titles and positions, have tweeted about, surprise, surprise, inclusion, specifically financial inclusion, which is a key part of digital identity. In one of my early SJ Weeklies, I talked about an article discussing financial inclusion. The long and short of it was, the banking system considers it an inherent good when more people are hooked into the financial system through a credit card or bank account. Of course, they would think so because it means more customers, but they also spin it as a way for people to access a system of privileges that comes with modern global finance, and that getting more people into the system is a matter of inclusivity and diversity and so forth because these unhooked people are all generally disenfranchised third worlders. This lines up with MasterCard's other initiatives, like their business stakes in Africa during that continent's unending cycle of investment and collapse, or the MasterCard aid network, bringing digital finance to aid programs in Yemen or other areas of political unrest. I'm not saying these things are inherently bad, I'm sure that hooking the third world into the digital marketplace can help tremendously with relief efforts by expediting the financial side of things. But there's no way that MasterCard is doing this solely out of the good of its non-existent heart. Remember, MasterCard's public policy states that when MasterCard as a company involves itself in politics, it's for the good of its own business ventures. MasterCard wants the business of millions of new customers. They wrap this goal in the language of diversity and progressivism by calling it financial inclusion. And then they advocate for the pro-economic migrant, pro-open borders, hard-left position that every fucking alt-right conspiracy theorist out there has been raving about for the past two years. From the MasterCard newsroom, forging new paths toward more inclusive growth and opportunity for all. The integration of the world's 25.4 million refugees into new communities is a topic that touches nations all over the world. Ironically, the solution for refugees who are adapting to a new home is in creating inclusive growth and opportunity for all. At this critical time, MasterCard is entering into a new global partnership with the International Rescue Committee to increase access to essential technology and products to advance financial education and the provision of financial services for displaced populations around the world. To recap, if you're somebody who is not pro-open borders, pro-economic migrants, you are against MasterCard. And MasterCard will label you as anti-inclusive when they really just want to reach a massive untapped market under the guise of progressive philanthropy. Take this next bit with a grain of salt. These private messages are from an industry insider unwilling to attach his name to this information, unsurprisingly. Let's look at what he has to say. Take, for example, security in the payment world. Payment card industry data security standard set by the various card brands. Set by the companies on their own without government or regulatory oversight. Some US law refers to the PCI DDS, but only in reference to merchants. Entities are not required to be compliant, but compliant entities are shielded from liability in the event of a data breach. My business got breached. Visa and MasterCard forced us to hire a PCI forensic investigator to discover what happened. They issued a report to Visa and MasterCard. They decided I owed a fine. What would happen if we didn't do this? We would be cut off from their network, thus unable to take any form of payments online. They have great infrastructure to block merchants, to prevent people from accessing networks, and to restrict the flow of capital. They built it in broad daylight 
in the name of security, MasterCard and Visa have effective control over non-physical cash payment. If you oppose them in any way, they can use the PCI DDS to shut you down. The financial industry is dependent on Visa and MasterCard allowing you to process. This is a cartel, not a free market. But it's a far bigger cartel than just PayPal and Stripe acting against Subscribestar on behalf of Patreon. This is a cartel of credit card companies that have control over the world's financial infrastructure. And now that social justice has seeped its way into MasterCard, MasterCard is using this infrastructure to cut people they politically disagree with off from the global marketplace. PCI DDS is the tool in place that can be used to unilaterally exile any business from having an online financial presence. Jacqueline Hart makes reference to this in her call with Matt Christensen, remember. Payment processing depends on our ability to use payment networks, and we have to abide by those rules. If only we knew what those rules really said. Well, why don't we take a look? Here's an internal PDF from MasterCard titled, MasterCard Rules. In the articles regarding Jihad Watch and David Horowitz, MasterCard qualifies them as high-risk merchants due to their political affiliations. But within MasterCard's own set of rules, politics is not considered high-risk. Gambling is adult content is, pharmaceutical, tobacco, and cyber locker are all considered high risk, but there's no mention of politics. And certainly there's been other political contributors that haven't been unpersoned. Why are only some of them high risk to MasterCard? And what exactly are they high risk towards? Maybe it's their long-term plans. Well, how do these rules play out in the real world? To answer that question, you only have to take another stroll down Twitter lane. These tweets come from the account as well as the interconnected network of MasterCard Vice Chairman Ann Cairns, champion of innovation, diversity, and inclusion, of course. Ann tweets, Looking forward to speaking at the Bocconi Alumni Global Conference this morning. MasterCard EU replies with, Public-private partnerships can stimulate economic growth, drive innovation, but we need to cut tape and increase pace. We need to look at how we can embrace global standards quickly and stop protecting local barriers to global innovation. And at that event, back 2015, what was talked about? Great discussion on competition. Less regulation. More standards. Stop countries from doing their own thing. If you need me to read between the lines for you here, then the message is this. Nationalist and populist movements that disrupt MasterCard's global financial plans are considered local barriers to be overcome. MasterCard must bring these rogue nations to heel and stop them from doing their own thing. So if these are the rules, what would actually be the long-term plan? Let's talk about Anne herself for a bit, as she's an excellent example of exactly the type of inclusivity data merger I've been talking about this whole time. At yet another women's financial meeting in 2018, Anne said, corporations can get involved in social issues. At MasterCard, we're building a sustainable business model that lets us do something good. Unsurprisingly, Anne also has her hands in the pockets of Sadiq Khan's London municipal government. She also views Germany as having conditions right for a shift in regards to MasterCard's long-term goal, stating that sophisticated consumers with smartphones are still paying cash. That perfectly describes somebody like an economic migrant who thus far has not been hooked up to the global banking system, who thus far has not been financially included yet. Yes, Germany would have quite a few of those, wouldn't she, Merkel? Anne is also not too happy that Brexit is happening, it seems. Less economic migrants for her company to financially include, I guess. Anne also thinks that diversity and inclusion must be embedded into all levels of the company's operation, from the products and services to providing universal parental leave for its employees. And if you have any doubt that it's feminism that is subservient to MasterCard's business model and not the other way around, Anne would like to have a talk with you about recognizing how women's monetary contribution has a massive influence on their ownership of a debit card. Every time MasterCard preaches about diversity and inclusion. Every time Anne says something like, there's no point in having the internet of everything if you don't have the internet of everyone, they're all being massive fucking hypocrites. Because as we've seen, MasterCard has no problem with excluding people who speak out about things they're invested in. MasterCard sees a potential marketplace of unbanked individuals in the Middle East's economic migrants. So Jihad Watch and Milo and Horowitz had to go. MasterCard is invested in the current tech cartel. So Gab and BitChute and Subscribestar had to go. And remember, again, political activities in which MasterCard engages in are based solely upon the best interests of the company. This is by design. It's easy to look at tweets and articles like this and simply see more boring SJWs and feminists shitting up yet another industry. You've seen way too many YouTube videos on that topic the past five years, right? Well, if that's all you take away from this, then you're willfully blind. Because while that is all here, it's not even the important part. This is digital identity. The merger of inclusion with data. Political and social inclusion with financial inclusion. And what it means to MasterCard. 
it does not simply end with progressive ideology. Let me show you what I mean. Here's two very separate, very different tweets. One is about MasterCard enabling payments on social media. The other is Anne pushing a global identity over a national one. What ties these two disparate messages together is the concept of digital identity. Here's another great combo. MasterCard believes the EU needs a digital single market. MasterCard believes that refugees need a digital ID. What connects these two? Digital identity. Cash is the enemy of inclusion. Digital ID for refugees. Digital cash for refugees. Proof of identity is the first rung on the ladder towards gender equality. Cashless Africa. Without identity, demographics are skewed. MasterCard works to integrate refugees. Cashless efficiency. Financial inclusion unlocks social progress and economic potential. Diversity cannot be a nice to have. It's all digital identity, inclusion, and data. Political and social inclusion and financial inclusion are one in the same for MasterCard as a company. That's why hooking migrants and third worlders into the global financial system is treated with the same level of seriousness as social justice. That's why digital identity is a combination of inclusivity and data. That's why this is MasterCard's endgame. Get as many unhooked people into the global financial system as you can. If this means supporting Africa initiatives under the guise of philanthropy, fine. If it means supporting open borders policies or refugees under the guise of being socially inclusive, fine. With this global financial system and its ever-expanding user base, push to take money out of the equation, phase out signatures for chipped cards and passwords, push digital ID, link finance to social media, hashtag cashless society. Once finance and identity have both gone entirely digital, use the PCI DDS framework to deplatform anybody you disagree with. Oh, you made an anti-immigrant post on Facebook? Well, not only are you banned from Facebook, and not only can you no longer use PayPal, but your MasterCard will no longer be used for groceries, your bank account will no longer transfer money to your landlord, and your digital ID has been revoked. That is the scope of power that MasterCard is laying out. We've already seen the rumblings of this happening, deplatforming people from the whole of society for their political views. I don't just mean being thrown out of restaurants. I mean Blizzard's Battle.net taking away the games you've paid for because you participate in the chat room of Twitch channels that they consider to be toxic. I mean a landlord refusing to rent you because of your workplace history. I was just trying to rent a room in an apartment building and uh, they, you know, this ad that someone put out, they, they, they Googled me, they saw my, I'm assuming they saw my Twitter or Facebook or something, and it said that I used to work at Fox, and they sent me back an email saying, um, like, you know, we're sorry, but you're, we have different political views than you, we hate Fox, uh, good luck in your search for housing. And this was actually the second time that it happened first time it happened actually yesterday. I mean credit cards considering blocking purchase of firearms using their infrastructure because they are legal to buy and own in the United States. And each time one of these things happens, there's always some weaselly little SJW pawn on Twitter talking about how good, how progressive, how inclusive a move it is, not understanding how his politics have been entirely co-opted by the businessmen he hates. This mentality, that it's okay for you to subjectively use whatever little bits of power you may have against innocent people for purely political reasons has been trickling down through society for the past decade. Getting thrown out of a restaurant is just a tiny symptom of a massive problem permeating the fabric of how we do business with each other. Social media moving to require a phone number rather than an email to make a new account recently is just another step along this road, but I bet I know the next one. I guarantee you, we will soon see a push by MasterCard or some other involved entity, with the tagline of moving past passwords. That will be the next campaign. You can ban a DNA sample or a fingerprint from a database, and in doing so, you can permanently ban somebody undesirable. But you can't ban somebody from just making a new username and password. It's a parallel move to the whole cashless thing, and the digital ID thing, and the linking social media to MasterCard thing. A perfect way to permanently ban somebody from the financial system. You can't freeze somebody's money if it's physically in their pocket. You can't freeze somebody's accounts if they're not tied to their physical body. This is, of course, disastrous on every level. Laws exist to protect you from having to give up your password for a locked device, but no such law exists for using a fingerprint or a DNA match and lawfully collecting those things is exceptionally easy. Moreover, fingerprints are very easy to spoof, making them significantly less secure. This is why cash is the enemy of inclusion, because they're referring to inclusion into their control. This is how much they hate anonymity. This is how much going anon threatens them. And this is why, around late 2017, MasterCard's tune began to change. It shifted from inclusivity to punishing those who refuse to become inclusive. Parallel inclusivity causes distrust. We can't lose sight of safety and security. When you get rid of peril, you are left with promise. 
who do you think the peril is going to be? I know, I sound like I've gone off the deep end, like I'm Alex Jones or something. And I'm not happy about it. I never considered myself to be a conspiracy theorist. But everything is here to see. And if you want it all wrapped up in one neat little package, just park these two tweets side by side. MasterCard. Corporations can get involved in social issues. Patreon. MasterCard required us to censor you. At this point, we're a long way off from Sargon and Jacqueline Hart and Patreon. And I do not think that somebody high up at MasterCard decided to call in a hit on Sargon's account. I think both Patreon and PayPal understand exactly what kind of obedience MasterCard is looking for, and are preemptively acting in the spirit of MasterCard's rules without being directly ordered. Thus far, there's no real evidence that other credit card companies are involved, but I frankly would not put it past them. But right now, MasterCard has shown itself to be morally bankrupt in the worst way possible. Opposing jihad and sharia, advocating for free speech or stricter immigration, critiquing social justice or feminism, contributing in any way to nationalist or populist movements or politics, because all of these things offend MasterCard, both in terms of ideology and in terms of business, will lead to their use of this extensive structure to break you. And let's be honest, the only reason we even know about this is, like in Gamergate, some low-level flunky with connections got sloppy and let a few details slip. Patreon is relatively inconsequential itself, but it has become a window through which we can peer into the inner workings of a monumentally corrupt financial system. I have every hope that Subscribestar will return. I have every hope that Jordan Peterson's attempt to make a funding platform will pan out. I have every hope that the YouTube lawyer filing paperwork with the Federal Trade Commission in order to get an investigation of Patreon and PayPal underway will somehow bear fruit. Can I do something that can actually make a difference here beyond the protest, beyond the speaking about it, beyond the explanation? And until somebody else picks up the mantle, I figure I'm in a unique position to actually do something here because I'm an attorney. Now, I know that some people are trying to work on potential alternative uh, platforms and alternative payment processing, and I think that's great. But I think that we need to try to do our best to actually stop the practice. So I decided to file a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission against Patreon and PayPal for collusion. Now, this is frankly a massive undertaking, so I basically want to tell you my story, why I decided and what I'm going to do and what it would take to actually succeed, because frankly, I need your help on this. I have every hope that Jack Conte grows a ball sack and just tells us the behind-the-scenes truth about all of this. Because frankly, Jack, your company is going under. And if it's going to go under, you may as well go under telling the truth and opposing tyranny, rather than absolutely cucking to it. We would forgive you, by the way, if you were honest. But according to Gab, the only reason their funding platform is not yet operational is because they cannot find a bank willing to process payments. This may be a significantly more intractable problem than we all initially realized. Far beyond just getting Jacqueline Hart out of Patreon or just building our own platform or whatever but I also don't believe that we're in a hopeless situation either. MasterCard may be the final boss, but as much as I hate to admit it, that's kind of our thing, isn't it? Our next move, the next clue we need to look for through Patreon's window, is the mechanism through which Milo turns into Hitler. Controversial becomes extremist, provoking becomes speaking hate, edgy jokes become inspiring terrorism or Nazism. Basically how these people convert free speech into justifications for deplatforming. This is why all the mainstream media coverage of this event, without question, has emphasized the capacity of Sargon and others to inspire acts of violence. Not commit violence themselves, but inspire others. This is why most of these outlets use phrases such as alt-right adjacent or linked to the far right. Because I guarantee you, Someone, somewhere, whether it's Anne at MasterCard or Soros at the CFR or whatever, someone is talking about using existing anti-terror legislation, along with big tech security measures, to handle your normal, garden-variety political dissent as if it were hate speech, using the excuse of inspiration. And they're very motivated to do so, solely because should that dissent ever cause another Trump or Brexit, it would be yet another wrench in their endgame plans. Another wave of popular resistance against their institutional objective of digital identity. And all because one edgy boy said a bad word on the internet. Please feel free to mirror this video. I have a feeling it's not going to stick around. Also, please share this video to everyone on every platform as much as you can. I mean it. I don't usually ask this of you guys. But this time, shout this one out from the rooftops. If you have connections to any big names within the intellectual dark web like Jordan Peterson or Dave Rubin, or even to normally non-political people like Pewds or whoever, 
send them this video. You can even just send them the proof if you like. I don't care that much about getting credit, but it is important that we orient ourselves towards our actual objective. And I no longer believe that to simply be Patreon or PayPal. Special thanks to Nick Monroe as well as the YouTube lawyer. Their research made up a good chunk of this video. I simply took it and made a watchable variant out of it. Unsurprisingly, I've recently been banned from Twitter for saying a bad word. But if you want to keep up with the goings-on of my channel and projects, a Twitter account owned by my girlfriend regularly posts about all of this stuff. If you followed me on Twitter before, please consider following the account Game Boomer Show now, because the main SFO Twitter that I actually owned will not be coming back. If you want to support my work financially, well, it's rather hard right now, isn't it? For one-time payments, please feel free to bop over to paypal.me slash shortfatotaku, or alternatively, you can donate through Twitch's sub button at twitch.tv slash gameboomers. I still have my Patreon up because, frankly, I need the money, but I cannot in good conscience suggest it. And to be honest, it will probably be taken down soon anyway. And hey, if you want to see me not maniacally rant about the end times, but just chill out and play video games with friends and chat room, hit up that Twitch channel every weekday night at around 7pm EST. I hope to see you there. Alright.